Next on Python Hunters. The hunters are on the lookout for some new Everglades invaders. Oh my god, look at them all. The green iguana and the African rock python. Very, very magnificent animal. Very misunderstood. Plus, the prolific and powerful Burmese python. Right. Oh, got me too. When they feel threatened, they're gonna come out, shoot. Ah. <laughs> Burmese pythons have invaded Florida. To eradicate them, the states issued 15 special permits to snake experts. And these men got permits one, two, and three. Biologist Sean Heflick has been chasing, studying, and breeding reptiles his entire life. I've never been afraid of snakes. Exotic reptile breeder and cop Greg Graziani knows his pythons inside and out. I got my first Burmese python when I was 12 years old. Python breeding pro Michael Cole has sold his designer color mutations for as much as $25,000. I've learned about reptiles the hard way. I didn't go to school for it. It was a passion. Now these snake breeders are defending the Everglades. They are the Python Hunters. Hey, 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 Python. Got one? Yeah, a little one. Right here, right here in this thicket. Guys, you coming? Not far. I can't get through here. I'm four yeah. feet away and I can't get through here. You got it? Where you at? Right here. You tagged me a couple of times. <laughs> oh, that's a nice one. Oh, oh, we got you again. Yeah. He's wrapped around that, uh, that wood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got it. Ooh, got him. Ow, ow. There you go. That's yeah, you. Oh. Watch your face. <laughs> I love you, baby. Want kisses? <laughs> Kiss the baby. Clean looking animal, but he's got some bite wounds or something on his neck. A bit of scarring in that. Not surprising, given this carnivore has only its powerful jaws to grab hold of both predators and prey. Awesome, awesome, awesome little dude. Right here in this sun patch as I walk through. Don't do that, not on the thumb. No, 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 <laughs> no, 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 somebody. It's also not surprising that this species from Southeast Asia has taken hold in the Everglades. Get some temps, Greg, you know, because he was in that sun. 88 degrees on the head. Wow, yeah. So he's sitting here warming himself up. Perfect location. These cold-blooded creatures need the heat for building energy. And I think I rattled that, uh, I think I rattled that branch. Right, right, and right. Boom. Keep oh. This habitat offers ideal cover to hunt Here, or hide. Wipe your hand and one more down. Good stuff. The plan's starting to come together. More than one tenth of the animal species living in the Everglades don't belong here. Florida Fish and Wildlife estimates that this already fragile ecosystem is home to hundreds of invasive mammal, fish, reptile, and bird species. Plus, over a thousand exotic insect and plant species. Nearby Miami is an international port with a large exotic animal trade. So some of the foreigners came to Florida by accident but some were introduced on purpose. Because of the hospitable climate, diverse habitats, and limited predators, most are thriving, but one in particular is getting all of the bad press. I know there's huge hysteria because these are snakes. Out of the 453, 457 non-native species that FWC monitors, we're only worried about one and that's the Burmese python. Dispelling that hysteria has the python hunters on a mission. We need to tread carefully, we need to go slowly, and we need to figure out before spreading mass hysteria what really is going on with these populations out there. 
There's no doubt they shouldn't be there. Nobody's gonna argue that. They're exotic, they don't belong, but they're not necessarily the alligator that ate Manhattan. How do these Burmese pythons fit into the ecosystem? What are they eating? What's eating them? Well, we know they're generalists. They, they can pretty much take anything. They're taking small mammals, the rats and, and rabbits, birds. They've taken alligators. Is there any other data at this point that there is a decline in another species due to these pythons? We know that these pythons have eaten at least one wood stork and at least one blue heron. But we also know that wood storks and blue herons eat a lot of snakes. And then we've got the American alligator. That's the big boy out there. That's the one that eats adult berms as well as juveniles and anything in between. It's definitely, I think, going to benefit that population. But there, there's no research on it. The hunters are performing a necropsy on a berm killed by cold weather for a close-up view of the adaptations that have made it so successful. We can speculate that there'll be absolutely no problems or that the problems will be horrific. But what do we have to look at to, to figure that out? Maybe no one would notice if the pythons stayed in the wilds of the Everglades, eating rats and rabbits. But they don't. You could see that dog was barking and barking. We know something's wrong. Rafael Gonzalez thought it was crazy when his daughter told him what she smelled in the chicken coop. I already got like the sense of the smell of them. And I, you know what, they smell like snake around here. And the next day when we came, the snake was right there in the back. And one of her ducks is gone. An easy meal for a large constrictor that squeezes the life out of its prey. Michael knows firsthand the strength of a Burmese python. I can describe what it's like to be attacked by a python pretty good, because I was grabbed by a 12-foot Burmese python and wrapped up. It was my own mistake. I was feeding the animal, and it got a hold of my hand instead of the prey. And when it wraps up around its prey, it squeezes. It squeezes. Every time you breathe out to take a breath, it tightens. Eventually, what happens is you cannot breathe in anymore and that's how it eventually suffocates its prey. What makes these things so powerful is not that they have copious amounts of muscle. You see how they tie in at a cross section, right? Yep. They, they literally make a cross hatchwork. And that's what makes them so powerful is the way their muscles contract and, and are tied into the ribs and into the spinal column. It's a ratcheting system. You know, it locks it into place. Burmese python, 12 and a half feet long, is not big enough to suffocate me. Had I not known what I was doing, and if I were a smaller person, it could have been a pretty, pretty tricky spot to be in. Like the one the Gonzalez family was facing. Stuck in their fence was a snake thick with their missing duck, swallowed whole. When they eat the duck, it was like this. The family decided to attempt to capture it. When we corner an animal like that, when they feel threatened, they're gonna come out, you know, shooting, so to speak. And she tried by me and she bite the wood. She bite the wood, you know, we look and look. We were able to pull her out, okay? But she tried to get away from us. But at the same time, when we were pulling around, she started losing like a uh, fluid. It was uh, like urine or something. And it smelled, but it was like an oil. Ah, spewing all over the place. Ah. They have uh, glands that they'll secrete this foul smelling odor. And if you're a predator and you get that in your face or you get that, God forbid, you get in your mouth, you're going to think twice about devouring that thing. The Gonzalez's got the python into a bin. With its energy completely depleted by digestion, the snake regurgitates its prey as an escape tactic. This is her mouth right here, and this is the duck. And here's when we called uh, the fire department and they came to pick her up. This is the snake itself. I'm afraid, especially for my animals, my dogs, okay? Because they're small dogs. She was able to get a duck 
I know my dog. It's just a perfect dinner for her. The Burmese python's occasional appearances in urban and suburban areas has got the state officials' attention. But no one truly knows what impact this invasive species is having on a much more vulnerable environment, the Everglades. Yes, uh, the officer Cohen, this is Michael Cole, one of the python hunters. We're gonna be going out doing a hunt today. It was almost a joke when Michael approached the commissioners and said, well, we need to take the Everglades back. And one of the commissioners said, are you willing to go out and hunt pythons? And Michael said, yeah, I've got more people with me that are willing to help. I'm permit number one, two, and permit number three. And the commissioners were like, well, it looks like we've got three guys that are serious that can go out, collect these snakes, get the data we need to see exactly what, if any, detriment they are to the environment. And that's pretty much how the, the team got put together. Slow down, slow down. Oh, what are you hollering about, man? Oh, nothing. Just a burp. Look at that. Dude, I walked not yeah, 20 yeah, feet yeah, from yeah. here. It's coming towards this log. I don't think I'd have seen it, but it was moving. They can barely see it, and it can barely see them. You know what? It's in a shed. It can't even see. Totally blued. It has no idea. If I stand still, this snake will crawl right past me. Oh, he's deep in shed. Look at that. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think you can see it. The damn thing. As snakes grow, their skin doesn't. So they need to shed their skin as often as several times a year. The clear scales that cover their eyes dry out and appear to turn blue. For that time, they are nearly blind and have to rely on their heat sensing to know when another animal is near. He doesn't even know my, that's my foot. Sounds something, look at him sniffing. He also's got that heat sensing. He just realized a big mass of animal look. just got in front of him. And, and look what he did. He immediately rerouted himself. Yeah. You know, in this state, that snake is defenseless, a almost defenseless. I mean, you can come within two feet of it and do whatever you want. Yeah, predator you know? would have no problem taking this animal right now. I tell you, this is pretty cool because we rarely get the opportunity to watch these guys like this. It's always run, snatch, grab, you know. All because of the shed, I guarantee it. All because of the shed. <laughs> get some pics while he's, you know, yeah. while he's doing his thing. This foreigner's survival is helped by its tan, brown, and black camouflage blending it seamlessly into the glade's grasses. In his viewfinder, I can't, I can't see him. I mean, I know where he's at. I have a look with my naked eye and see that one section. For the capture, Michael's snake catching technique is one that should only be used by experts. Typically, what we'll do is uh, grab the animal by the tail and a lot of times at that point, they get aggravated because they're being restrained and they want to know what has them. You can see this animal's being a little bit aggressive here. We can use this hook here to direct the head a little bit. There we go. And uh, once we've got the animal behind the back of the head there, got him under control, we can control the tail which again, you can see he's starting to uh, musk and uh, urinate and defecate. And the first thing they do is start to try and bite you, and then they start throwing loops around that head until you release it. <laughs> Half forgetting this isn't a tame snake. Hey, you grab me by the neck like that, I'm gonna bite you too. Snake's in good shape. I tell you, being a snake lover, sometimes it's difficult to not want to just let him go. Just let him go on his way. Totally at 89. They don't belong in this ecosystem. 
we have to move them out of it. We have to take them into captivity, and that's what we've been charged to do by the Florida Fish and Wildlife. So we're going to have to do that. Vulnerable as it may be right now, at just over seven feet, it's young, healthy, and time for this invader to go. All right, let's get this one bagged and get going before it gets too hot out here. You got to do the bag? <laughs> do the damn bag. You can go deep. It's all right. After nearly two decades of pythons breeding here, the hunters face an overwhelming task. As far as the wild population of Burmese pythons here in Florida, there have been estimates anywhere from 3,000 to 117,000 out there in the wild. After going out and working for a number of months and capturing those animals, I honestly couldn't tell you how many are actually out there. But if I had to bet, the number's much closer to 3,000 than it is to 117,000. The hunter's task today is to determine just how much damage invasive species are doing to the Everglades. As far as the invasive reptile species in Florida, we really don't know if any of them are actually detrimental to the ecosystem or not. South Florida is now home to a number of species, both birds, fish, mammals, and reptiles, that uh, are exotic and have been established. That sun's feeling good. We haven't got any studies back that actually show a decline in native species. Man, box turtle shell. We need to show that there's a decline in those species for there to actually be an ecological problem. So that's part of what we're here to figure out. This is a native Florida box turtle shell. It's a neat little turtle, actually, that lives down here in South Florida. Rather rare to find anymore. They used to be very abundant, but crossing the road, and actually they make great pets, so they were collected up for pets in a lot of places. Now that the uh, state laws protected them, so we're not allowed to just take them. Poor guy has probably died in the, in the brush fire that came through here. Brush fires are a natural process in the Everglades. Valuable for renewing the soil and the plant life, but deadly to any small animal unable to outrun them. And uh, it's amazing to me to see within a couple hundred yards, three of them. Uh, I haven't seen three Florida box turtles in the wild in the last 20 years. What do you got? Turtle nest has been dug up. It's a fresh one, which means there's uh, got to be some good prey on this island for some berms. All the other turtle nests we found have been, you know, really, you know, dry and. Oh, and these are these still, look at this. They still got yolk. Yeah. Look at that. That was probably dug up last night. Oh yeah, it's not dried at all. The eggs still supple. I still got a good egg in here. Really? Yeah. yeah. Oh, don't yeah, don't molest it. But it wasn't a Burmese python that ate these turtle eggs. Some mammal has, has more than likely found these eggs and scarfed down, what, one, two, three, four, five, six? The only seven. mammalian predators that are going to do that kind of damage is, uh, is raccoon or possum. Yep. I think the best thing we do, we don't know how many other eggs are down here, but let's go ahead and cover this back up gently and uh, go ahead and throw some of this foliage back over here and, and hopefully Maybe our scent will be enough to keep uh, another raccoon or something out of here. All right, and I, I know this this may sound crazy, but uh, I'm going to urinate around this thing to keep predators away from it. Knock yourself out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on the wrong side of this. They don't like the scent of human. You know, we're we're an alien in this landscape for the most part. Hey, Sean, I got something right up your alley over here, buddy. Smell, sight, we're just weird creatures. I've got some feces. <laughs> Looks like two different piles, actually. This one, full of turtle eggs. Look at all this. And even better, we've got an insect wing. So whatever this was, it's a generalist. It's an omnivore. And if you look here, got some telltale signs of hairs that look like possum hair, probably taken in from grooming. So it's possibly a, a possum. Yeah, unless a <laughs> raccoon was grooming a possum. That's a possibility. <laughs> <laughs> this is I feel a... like I'm hunting with Elmer Fudd. <laughs> 
Well, I certainly would have expected it to be raccoons rather than possums. But you know what? Possums are just a consummate omnivore. They just like to eat anything they can get a hold of. Small mammals are ravenous and resilient and can upset this fragile ecosystem. But the hunters have a bold theory on what animal is balancing that. These Burmese pythons may actually be slithering right into a niche that has been depressed, and that is the meso predators or the middle predators. No one wants them there. We, we realize they don't belong, but they'd be doing a service. We've lost a lot of those predators, like the bobcats and the coyote, that would feed on the same thing, the rats and the raccoons and, and the rabbits down there. This has got some good beetle Ooh, parts yeah. all through it. Look at that. Yeah. Are you guys are finishing up here? I'm just backing away. because Now who's getting excited about a little feces, huh? Here we go. Look at this. All well, right. It's well, very interesting. You guys enjoy the rest of your feces. Yeah, we got a lot of good stuff. Uh, let's go find something alive now. The hunters travel to the edge of the sawgrass marsh to hunt through the knee-deep waters. There's some snail eggs. Yeah, those aren't uh, native, though. Those are the Asian apple snail eggs. <laughs> Not supposed to be here. That's all we got up by me. Yeah, these, these things are out-competing the, the indigenous one. You know, the indigenous ones are large, about twice the size, and white, just white. snow white. These are real easy to tell because they're pink and small. Yeah, the, the native ones are, the egg itself is twice that size. Well, you know, there's only one thing to do with these, right? Shoot, all you have to do is drop, drop them in the water. water at this point, they drown, right? Uh, guaranteed better than that. Just squish them to be done with it. The caviar. It tastes like crap. <laughs> I'll take your word for it. This water is way deeper than I thought it was going to be. Yeah. I think the hardest thing that goes on when we're out hunting snakes is truly finding them. Oh, squishy there. I mean, we put a lot of time and a lot of effort out there. We bust our butts. It's hot. It's mosquito ridden. You know, there's lightning. We can get rained on. It's putting in the time on the ground, putting in the effort, sometimes painstakingly so. You're in saw grass, you're in water, you're, you know, you're getting muddy, you're getting filthy. I think I just sucked the snail up. <laughs> oh, God, it's cold, man. I think that there are some labors out there that we go through, but they're labors love because we appreciate these snakes for what they are and how magnificent they are. Dang, we don't catch anything. You're swimming back. <laughs> well, swimming back? I got the key in my pocket. Ah, this is gorgeous. Look at this, man. Nice, high, and dry. This is uh, female laying terrain right here, man. Yeah, this is nice. At least, look at that mount. That, that mount's three feet above uh, water level. Yeah. Nice sunspot right through the center here. Look at this. What's that, Michael? Oh. He said that this reminds him where he used to bring his cousins <laughs> when he was younger. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'm not even, I'm not even gonna touch that, Sean. Oh, I'm sorry, I hit too close to home. <laughs> Where's the head? Where's the head? <laughs> Oh, he got, he got me too. Hang on. Hang on. All right. Good job, Michael. Good snag. Good job, man. Was he man. floating, swimming? Which way was he headed? 
Did you hurt right? something? I broke a knee. Oh, you got it? <laughs> all right. It was worth it. all right? It. Yep. I'll be fine. It was worth it for the cause, buddy. Ooh. Ooh. Oh. <laughs> That's my snake. Little frisbee. <laughs> hey, come on, man. Uh, yeah, look back. This way. <laughs> you know what, though? Here's the kicker. Oh, he got me, Lil. Yeah. He didn't nick me. Oh, you'll be all right. Uh, well, we've got two islands here. Obviously, this animal's moving from, right. from island to island. Um, but this is your snake, right? I wasn't expecting one out here. But this is your snake, right? Well, yeah. 100% your snake. My God. All right, just clearing that up, because we got to go back to the to the the uh, beast. We got to get all the measurements and everything. We'll give you a GPS. <laughs> you and, come uh, back. It's pretty simple. We're halfway between <laughs> these two islands, so it's a real easy spot to mark. So you come back but and uh, get it. It's your snake. This guy's been out here probably since it was born, um, living in one of these tree islands and traveling back and forth, getting what it needs to eat. This is probably right around two years old, either a two or a three year old. It just depends on how much food it's, it's actually getting out here as to how fast he grows. The hunters can guess at the approximate age of the snake by its size. I mean, look at this. I mean, this animal is full of fatty bodies. Mm -hmm. Back at the lab, the necropsy shows this snake was a healthy predator. He's definitely been eating. Um, we get all this fat stores over here. Food intake is stored in fat deposits that run along the length of the snake's body. Nothing in there. Obviously, this animal is eating uh, well enough, and they're efficient enough to only eat a few times. Yeah, you know, we've heard that the media and, and others have put that out there that they're talking about. These animals eat daily, and they're sucking down all this food. And we know that not to be true. It could be out there maybe only having to eat once a month. Maybe that constitutes 12 you know, fair-sized prey items. And maybe not even that many, because you look at the cooler months where they don't feed. So maybe that constitutes eight or nine. It has done well to adapt to the, these newest surroundings. Well, thanks to us, no more. The average size of the Burmese pythons the hunters are capturing is around nine feet, about three quarters of their maximum length in the Everglades. So the hunters don't believe the opportunistic pythons are pillaging the Everglades of its endangered species. But what impact could the thousands of pythons be having on the rest of the ecosystem? Anytime there's a large injection of a creature that gets to such immense size and preys on such a wide variety of animals, that there is a definite possibility of it becoming established, and especially in an environment such as the Everglades, where we got great weather year-round and lots of stuff to eat. It's a swallowtail kite, one of the most graceful birds of prey that there is. Fortunately, they nest high, and they don't hardly ever come to the ground except for when they're on prey, so the Burmese pythons shouldn't affect them too much. This guy just won't quit. Trying to get you? Still? He still wants a piece of it. You know, there's a lot of speculation there about this wild population down there, and I, I think really the goal of, of what we're trying to do is the more pythons we catch, the more data we collect, and the better the science that comes out the other end is. And it, it helps us answer the valuable and critical questions that so many people have. Greg, look at that gator right there. He's coming in for a Burmese python dinner. <laughs> Sorry, buddy, I'll have to get the next one. This one's mine. Most never questioned that the American alligator was the apex predator of the Everglades, until recently. In 2005, Everglades National Park Service made an incredible discovery. A Burmese python was found split open with the remains of a 1.8 meter long alligator inside. The photos crossed the globe, raising questions about who is the top predator in the Everglades. When this picture came out, and then the media's imagination just ran wild. They want, you know, Godzilla, you know, versus the giant serpent. And, and we know that not to be true. It's just an impossibility. And there are a lot of issues with this picture. And one is that, you know, this python swallowed this alligator alive, and then the alligator clawed its way out of the python. Anybody who has ever dealt with pythons in, in captivity knows that pythons do not eat live items. 
I don't Burmese python can't crush on a six foot alligator skull. Absolutely not. My first thought when I saw this picture was, you know, here's a dead alligator that killed a Burmese python. The alligator skull was crushed. Um, so it was either dead or dying. And the snake ate it. And, and he's gonna consume something that's already dead. Uh, he's gonna take that chance before he's gonna go after a live one and have to fight it to kill it and, and, and do that. So he'll try and eat something bigger. Let's say a large gator comes along. You're this python sitting there trying to digest this massive meal, and he sees an opportunity. If you're under those conditions, now you become the disadvantaged prey item for a predator. And you have a bit of a struggle, and a gator being a gator rips your head and part of your, your neck off. Free meal, and he swims away with it. One thing's 100% sure. If we get rid of the Burmese pythons out there, this can't happen again. Florida's thousands of invasive plant and animal species cost the state hundreds of millions of dollars a year between the damage they cause and the efforts to control them. And now there's a new kind of python fish and wildlife officers need to contend with. We're not just dealing with the Burmese python. We're talking about the African rock python. Very, very magnificent animal. Incredible looking and very misunderstood. The African rock python is the largest snake in Africa and in the pet trade is mistakenly thought to be the most vicious of the giant snake species. Unfortunately, the African rock python has gotten a bad name for being aggressive and nasty and that's simply because very few people have ever worked with captive African rock pythons. Since 2002, authorities have discovered eight African rocks in a small area east of the Everglades, including a female with eggs. Thought to be once released pets, this discovery is raising fears of a new invasive population taking hold. Or worse, a combination Burmese and rock python? Somebody came up with an idea, what if they got together and produced a super snake. Just, just to calm everybody's mind, there is no super snake out there. Uh, to get a natural population, even, you know, a misplaced population, to interbreed with another population is almost nil. These kind of rumors have the python hunters frustrated. I think the state of Florida right now, there's a lot of hysteria over, you know, exotic reptiles in the wild. During the first half of the last century, Florida saw an unprecedented population surge. With the growing urbanization, planners drained the Everglades and rerouted them through more than 2,200 kilometers of canals. This disrupted existing habitats, creating new problems that then needed new solutions. Since their introduction in the 1930s, the cane toads may have had more of an impact on the Everglades than the pythons. Oh, you got a bufu toad there, man. Another one of our uh, alien invaders here. Look at that boy. That's a big fatty, too. They now number in the millions. Uh, that guy's going to have to come with us, another uh, invasive animal here. Well, this was introduced to control the cane beetle. Here's an animal that was introduced for a good purpose that turned out to really take over and, and it's a it's a big pest down here now right it's kind of like chasing your tail well we can fix this problem but we're going to create two more very few predators for this animal because of the uh, poison glands it secretes poison so i can squeeze them a little bit and you can see the toxin coming out of there an animal bites onto that it gets some of this poison on it in his mouth he's done he's out of here he's he's not going to finish eating it yeah, looks like uh, he's actually got some damage to one of his glands there, like uh, he's actually been bit by something. Well, we notice he's still here. Yeah. So those uh, those poison glands right there. They must Good. work. Now my son won't mind him coming home. Another neat little critter, but one that doesn't belong here, so let's get him removed. All right. The cane toads demonstrate that effective defense strategies are key to an invasive species success even for the smallest of them. 
fire ants are an impressive, impressive species. You know, they, they account for a massive amount of biomass destruction of native species. You see, they just go crazy when you disturb the nest. You can see how they just hunker down, sting, inject that venom. Pretty horrific if, if you were an animal that typically fed on indigenous ants. They have no natural predators here in the United States and down in South America. Strangely enough, flies regulate these things. The flies come in, they lay their eggs within the colony, they hatch out, and, and that's the way that, that fire ant populations are maintained. Um, here, I've got nothing. Nothing wants to eat these things. You really want to, you know, put yourself in that situation is if you eat, some of you, you know, chew fast. They're real acrid, real acidic, and uh, not the best tasting of ants, without a doubt. Go ahead. No. <laughs> what? You gotta try I know where your hands have been. <laughs> it has nothing to do with the ants. <laughs> Chew fast. You still got one on your finger. <laughs> They're just acidic. You know, but who wants to eat that, you know? Who wants Not a me. mouthful of that? Thanks for uh, sharing that. Hey, that's what I really I appreciate it. I'm here for you. Tell you this is pretty sad. You know, this is nothing but exotics in here. This, you know, right underneath a canopy of Australian pines. And well, they are well adapted to South Florida. You know, they get a foothold and they just keep growing. And the crazy stuff is that all of this, the needles that they drop, contain a chemical that suppresses the growth of indigenous plant life. That's why there's absolutely nothing else besides this growing up. Their roots secrete the same chemical, which allows basically just them to grow. I mean, it doesn't get more invasive and, and you know, adapted than that. These were all purposely brought in here that, that people didn't realize how devastating they were going to be down the road. Now, South Florida is, is, you know, the perfect breeding ground for all types of exotics. Very few other places in the world, uh, especially in the U.S., could support this type of stuff. Because of its subtropical climate, the Florida Everglades are home to more invasive plant species than anywhere else on Earth. That's what people don't understand is worldwide plants are far more problematic as invasive species than animals could ever be. Let's see if we can find some pythons in all this mess. You know what, I always wanted to go to the outback snake hunting. I guess we're here. Welcome. Welcome to the outback. Oh, what's that? They do find a python, but it's already dead. No doubt. Look at that. Nice large vertebrae on that. Look at the size of those ribs. That is a big animal. But nearby, the hunters uncover the python's last meal, another Everglades invader. We got, we got uh, this is pig hair. It's a feral pig. You want to talk about the most invasive, you know, animal besides human on this planet, at least in Florida? These feral pigs are, are just, they tear the landscape up. They tear crops up. They feed on anything. They're, they're opportunistic omnivores. You know, they'll eat snakes. They'll eat anything they can get their little mouths on. But unlike the Burmese python, not all of Florida's alien species are considered a public menace, especially at beachside. Oh my God, look at them all. Yeah. Holy This is cow. like a zoo exhibit. That's impressive. Look wow. At the, look at all the males, courtship display. Yeah. Head bobbing. Bobbing their head, throat plates out. What are they, easy hundred? Oh, easy. Dude, there's both That's species. That's just what we can see. Look at all the thick grass behind there. Yeah, but there's access to the beach over there. Two of the Everglades' three non-native species of iguana have taken up residence near this beach, the green and the spiny tail. And they've flourished because they're mostly ignored. Hey, Sean, check out the sign. Do not feed the iguanas. Don't feed him any fingers or 
you know what, though? They just put up a sign, don't feed the iguanas. They don't call in a trapper to get them. It's amazing, as an invasive species, that people are tolerating these animals right here. Talk about exotics and invasives. Here you've got two large iguanid species, the green iguana and the spiny-tailed iguana, and they're cohabitating right here under this huge cement slab. Originally from Mexico and South America, the iguanas came as stowaways on ships, were escaped or released pets, or were even blown here by hurricanes. It's amazing. These guys have been here so much longer than the Burmese pythons, and it doesn't bother anybody. No, they don't care. They're not afraid of people. Look at them. They've got a resort mentality. <laughs> They're out here in Club Med. If that was one python out there, there'd be 911 calls, yeah. let alone 100 pythons coiled up out here. People would be freaking out, and yeah. they'd, they'd evacuate this end of the island. No, nope, there's your pretty white male right there. Mm. I'm about ready to sneak up here, see if I can catch one. Yeah, tell you what, well, you know, I always keep a, a nice pair of uh, gloves just for this situation here, because like we talked about, these guys are gonna tear you up. You gotta worry about the claws, the mouth, and the tail. It's coming to me, wait for it. Sissy. <laughs> well, we'll see who catches what here. That dude's That's magnificent incredible right there. Right there. there. If you want him, you better cut him off because they're all going to pile in that hole right there. See, they've He's taken their going. time one at a time. <laughs> I can't believe how quick that <laughs> thing is, that? man. Look at dudes. Get that. Get that. Uh... Just got to jump on it, Greg. <laughs> Come on. Come on. But, uh, yeah, he knows what's up now. Got a big bite on his back. Go, 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 go. You got him. Animals blowing up. I mean, they just take in air immediately. Look, you can see the claw on this thing that's already hooked into the glove right here. Had I not had those gloves on, that would have been embedded in the side of my arm right there. Look at the, the horns on his nose. I mean, these, these things are just incredible, incredible animals. He got, holy cow, Mikey got one. Oh, he cheated. Uh, <laughs> how did I cheat? <laughs> you got a male or a female there? The yeah, male. The female. Well, well, they're poor, they're small though. Yeah, that's a female, female though. And you can tell, flip, flip it over. You can actually see the eggs in this animal. Let's put these two up as shorts. <laughs> He's got total advantage. But the big white male hasn't given up yet. Of course, neither will Sean. Rick right there? Yeah. Give me that glove. I'm not getting my finger bit. Reaching in through there. Hello? Yeah, I can't get past your glove. It takes up so much room. He's got his legs set on the edge of the concrete. You about to give up, Sean? The dude is in there. Hang on. I know this, when he comes out. He's gonna be he's mad gonna be, or hell. Well, he could turn right now and take a finger if he wanted, I think. He got himself all puffed up like that. Uh, I might lose a finger, which would suck in an iguana catch, huh? He's gonna be mad. All right, all right. Here we go, here we go, here we go. That's the boy. Yeah, that's, him. that's him. Look oh, at that. You wow. are a sexy lizard. Look at that. You Look at the difference in temperament lizard. between these two lizards. Check out that trachea. Just like the snake, you can see exactly where he breathes. When his mouth's closed, that goes up to the roof of his mouth, so he breathes right through his nostrils. That is an amazing animal right there. And here's another fine example. Now, this has been said that back in the day, um, Crandon Park Zoo, the old curator released tons of these spiny tails uh, and greens on the property. And, uh, you know, we're just right up the road from that. And they've right. had decades and decades to, to move on. Uh, back then, you know, before people knew better, they were kind of like peacocks. They brought them in, they let them loose on the grounds, and because they were fed and the habitat was there for them, they stayed on, on top of the zoo facilities that did that, along with the pet trade. Uh, they're, they're just South Florida is just covered with with these animals right and here. this is a large breeding population undisturbed until now he's he's been working the ladies working the ladies down he's gonna work your fingers if you let him no way him and I have an understanding I won't let go and he won't bite me. <laughs> all is sunny for the invasive iguanas 
but the forecast for the Everglades is anything but. The Everglades habitat is life-sustaining for the native plants and animals that live here. The most invasive species to threaten that balance is humans. Now, wildlife officials believe it's time to let us take care of one of the biggest invaders, the pythons. Let's use humans to control these pythons. What better way than a hunter that is uh, working his way through the woods, you know, and looking for rabbits or squirrels or whatever he's looking for, and he comes across a snake. He's already gonna have a gun in his hand, and he can dispatch that animal very rapidly. Or if he feels like it, he could catch the thing live. I mean, there's enough young guys that wanna wrestle with the thing, take it, show it off. How about coming for a python hunt? <laughs> Exciting, huh? Yes, this is Michael Cole, one of the python hunters. Yeah, we're going to be doing a hunt tonight. Permits one, two, and three. Greg Graziani, Sean Heflick, and Michael Cole. Let's get a move on before we get wet. Come on, Geek Squad, do it. Look at the head damage. Yep, yeah. This is not in good shape. He's got uh, marks all over him. He's had a rough time. Yeah. Even the weakest python can still pack a punch. Yeah, he's got good, good. I got the head and then it had just some debris up by his nose and I went to clear it. Yeah, go ahead and try that. Ah! <laughs> I told you. <laughs> you gonna do it again? <laughs> Did you hear him scream? I know, I know, you, I know you squeezed that animal's ass when I did that. <laughs> I know Greg squeezed the tail. It's all good. I got, uh, I got something for him. You know, it, it all comes around. <laughs> Not the prettiest snake in the world, but you know they don't have to be pretty uh, for us to capture him and get him out of this system. Typical Sean. Can't deal with authority. I warn you to. Yeah, go ahead and try that. Not three seconds. Bam. I think the misconception is that you think I view you as an authority. <laughs> I think therein lies the issue. I, I think I've already proven you should. <laughs> no. <laughs> Why, squeezing the snake's ass and getting me bit? What if we learned about the Burmese? We, we know that they have predators. We know that they're providing an extra food source. We also know that they're taking animals out of the ecosystem. But what we don't know is where that balance lies. Well, that's true. We need to get a lot more gut content because it seems that on these species that we have had reports of them eating, it's one here, one there. Uh, most of the consistent stuff we're finding are, you know, rodents and, and rabbits. Red snake, snake. That's a mouth. It's a water moccasin or cotton mouth one of four venomous snakes native to the Everglades. Man, that's a stinky snake. Yeah. He's already got a fang hanging oh, out. Oh, that venom right just dropping. You see that? Yep. Literally, he looks like he's grinning at us. White sheet hanging down over that fang is what you can see right there. Did it get the name? Cottonmouth. And it's humans that are most threatening to this native species. Every year, fearful people kill hundreds of these venomous animals. Down along the head. These give off the strongest oh, musk of no, no, any no, Floridian no, snake. You touched it. Yeah. We definitely don't want to uh, shorten our python hunting trip by getting nailed by one of these guys. Uh, definitely, uh, actually, one of the things we have to be more careful of than the pythons. Yeah. Are our pit vipers like this that we find out here? It won't kill you, but it's painful. The hunter's relationship with snakes is not based on fear, but respect. 
And as much as they admire and respect the Burmese python, the hunters know that like all invasive species, they don't belong in the Everglades. And their job won't be over for a long time to come.